I, like most of you who are watching, have been intrigued by the Murder Among the Mormons docuseries on Netflix. I had heard snippets of the story and knew of Mark Hoffman's name, but I had no idea of the whole story. When I was in seminary, though, getting my master's degree, Richard Howard came in and spoke to our class. He told us the story of Community of Christ's involvement, and I was transfixed. I was thrilled when Richard told me that he would speak to me today about it. I hope you enjoy this chat as much as I did. Hello, everyone. I am super duper excited to be here with my friend Richard Howard. And I, you are going to just be so excited about what he has to say today. So, Richard, hello and welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, so, Richard, before we jump into this, this little talk that we're going to have, this little chat we're going to have, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, well, I was born in 1929. I was baptized RLDS 1941. I uh, began working for the church historian uh, back in 1961 in the summers while I was teaching. And then full time started in October of 1962 as assistant historian for the RLDS church. Well, when the historian's health failed several years later, I became the acting historian. And then in 1966, I was appointed by the World Conference to be the church historian. And I served there until that, in that responsibility until September of 1994. Uh, I'm married to the famous feminist theologian and author and Herald House Associated ed Associate Editor, Barbara Peavy Howard. Uh, we have four adult children, 13 grandchildren, and five great grandchildren. Barb and I live in the Groves, which is an old folks' home in Independence, Missouri. So that's all you need to know, and probably more than you were interested in knowing. <laughs> oh no, that was beautiful. I loved hearing that. I, I <laughs> have always been fascinated by people's lives, and Richard, you have led a really cool life. So we're talking about like the murder among the Mormons docu series, and Community of Christ had a part in that, and you had a very uh, integral part in that. And so we're going to talk about that today. I really can't wait to hear. I really can't wait to hear what you have to say. So. Before we jump into the story, maybe we can talk a little bit about the background as to why, you know, there's that preoccupation with the lineal secession in Community of Christ, or then, of course, RLDS. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the very first RLDS conference uh, took place in June of um, 1852. They passed a number of resolutions, and uh, one of them was really anti Brigham Young and, and uh, other uh, sectarian uh, group leaders. But the second one was very, uh, very telling about our preoccupation with the whole matter of uh, succession. Uh, it, ha it says something like this. I want to read it exactly. The second, the second resolve of that June 1852 conference. Anyone serving the church as its prophet president must of necessity be a lineal descendant to Joseph Smith Jr., the church's founder. Consequently, RLDS leaders from then until 1996 honored that principle of lineal descent in church presidency. Uh, the presidents were Joseph III from 1860 to 1914, Frederick M. Smith, his son, from uh, 1915 until 1946. And then his brother, Israel A. Smith, uh, from 1946 to 1958. And then his half-brother, uh, uh, William Wallace Smith, from 1958 to 1978. And then his son, Wallace Bunnell Smith, 1978 to 1996. Now, a lot of our missionary and pastoral and educational publications uh, perpetuated this lineal descent principle, largely because of our antipathy toward the LDS Mormon Church. <laughs> that's sad, but um, uh, and that that's that's that was true right from the beginning and right on through the earlier part of the 20th century. 
Um, we we always reminded the public and uh, and the Mormons and us that this was not according to church law and scripture when we referred to the Utah Mormon Church uh, and their and their mode of succession was that their senior apostle would uh, sort of automatically take the prophetic uh, presidential chair. So this, this uh, tradition uh, developed that in 1844, Joseph Smith Jr. blessed his son in, in a special ceremony in the closing months of his life uh, to become his successor as president of the church. And, uh, but we didn't have any solid documentary proof to sort of buttress that tradition. Um, so for decades, the RLDS Church for generations had been looking for just such a documentary foundation, even though the prophets themselves really, really worried about it. And certainly never in print would they say anything over their own uh, signature. So um, the stage really is kind of set then by, by the 1980s for somebody to come along and find just such a document. <laughs> And the stage was set for someone to find just such a document. It was, yeah. Oh man! And so, so Mark Hoffman forges that mm -hmm. letter, or is it just a document? It's a prayer. A prayer. It's a, it's a prayer of blessing from father to son, uh, designating him to be his successor. That the the language is right there. Uh, so very clear. And so very perfect, I'm guessing. <laughs> yes, yes. And written in such meticulous handwriting by Thomas Bullock, Joseph Smith Jr.'s clerk. Oh, okay. He has an, almost an artistic handwriting, and it's so unmistakably Thomas Bullock that you don't need a sleuth to figure it out. You just look at it, oh, yeah, well, that's Thomas Bullock. <laughs> and, oh, interesting. And of course, Okay, well, I don't want to jump ahead of the story, and so the back of the document has uh, uh, ha it's folded over, and, and on the back is written Joseph Smith, uh, Joseph Smith's signature, supposedly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So um, that's what. So Mark, uh, kind of picture the forger in his basement. Um, enclave, which is locked all the time, whether he's in there or gone, it's locked. His wife can't get in. Nobody can get in. He's doing his forgery activity from 1980 forward. And, uh, and there he is uh, down there working on this document. He knows this RLDS context better than almost any RLDS would know it. So he can write, the, he can write a document just perfect for the context. So that's the, so that's kind of what we, what we see uh, coming up here pretty, pretty soon. <laughs> he knew exactly what we wanted. And you know, like it, it, from the docuseries, it kind of sounded like he really wanted to stick it to the Utah Mormons as well. Like he really wanted to hit mm -hmm. him where it hurt. And so this was like double duty. It sounded like I could be wrong, but it sounds like, you know, you get a, punch the Mormons a little bit, and you're going to make the RLDS church, now Community of Christ, very, very happy. And we might pay a pretty penny for it. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, and, oh, go ahead. So my next question, if you're ready for my next question. Yeah. So what happens now? So we, we now know that there's a prayer um, in a document form, and we want it really badly, right? Like... Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. sure the second you heard about it, you're like, we need that. That's ours. That belongs to us. So what okay. happened next? Well, in February of 1981, uh, Hoffman produced that, that forgery, the only forgery that dealt with uh, reorganized church uh, history and tradition. He phoned our history commission, and I was out of town. And so Madeline Brunson, the church archivist, 
she took the first call. And then there was an additional contact with um, my assistant, uh, Grant McMurray. Uh, and uh, he was, um, uh, he, he informed me about it, of course, uh, when I got back. And uh, so the three of us, Madeline and Grant and I, sat down in our uh, office and we, and we said, well, what, um, uh, oh, uh, Mark Hoffman said what he wanted for this was a book of commandments. You know, the early precursor to the Doctrine and Covenants. The book of commandments was an unpublished collection of the records of the revelations of Joseph Smith uh, to the church. Um, and it was in press, but it wasn't finished. Uh, but um, anyway, he wanted one of the, those are extremely rare and valuable. And so we, we, we closely examined our three copies of our book of commandments and tried to figure out which one we could afford to part with. <laughs> um, and uh, so then after we got that figured out and we counseled also with our supervisors and they, they said, go ahead with it. Uh, that's okay. And uh, so we, I called Mark Hoffman and scheduled a meeting with him in Salt Lake City on the second day of March and, and, and uh, with other of the Mormon church uh, department leaders. Uh, they're in the historical archives of the Mormon church. That's where the meeting took place. Um, so I flew out to Salt Lake City on the 2nd of March. Hoffman was late due to the birth of his uh, birth of a child to his wife, uh, Dora Lee. And I visited with the LDS people uh, in the in the office there while we were waiting for him. They were very good friends of mine from way back because I, after I became historian in 1966, uh, I had developed this friendship with Earl Olson, who was managing director of all the historical stuff there at uh, the church headquarters, and Don Schmidt, the librarian. So, and I had, uh, with Grant McMurray, I had negotiated several document exchanges since becoming the historian. And so our collegial relationships would benefit us later on. So Hoffman came into the meeting on, on March the 2nd. He showed us the document and we, all of us, examined it very carefully. After that meeting, I proposed to Hoffman that he bring the blessing document to independence and, and leave it for us so that we could uh, get some independent appraisal by forensic experts. He agreed that he would come on the 17th of March. Um, I flew back home, taking with me a photocopy of Hoffman's original. On March the 7th, just five days later, Lori Winder, who was editor of Sunstone Journal, phoned me to ask what I knew about the Hoffman Blessing document. I asked her, why did she want to know? And she told me that he had just sold it to the LDS Mormon authorities. Well, after my brief talk with Laurie Winder, uh, I was in a state of shock almost. I phoned Earl Olson and Don Schmidt, directors of the LDS archives, and, and told them that in selling the blessing document to them, Hoffman had violated his agreement with me to bring it to us on the 17th of March and leave it for our work on it. Well, they didn't know anything about that agreement. And so they apologized profusely and they, they told me that uh, they would return the blessing to Hoffman. Well, I said, hey, I don't want any more to do with Hoffman. <laughs> I didn't suspect forgery, but I didn't like his business practice. So Olson called me back within the next hour to confirm that we would trade our book of commandments for their document pending our 90 days to uh, verify the document by independent uh, forensic uh, examination. So on March the 18th, I flew to Salt Lake City. I stayed overnight with the LDS pastor there, Sid Troyer. Sid and Nidra, they're really wonderful people. And uh, he volunteered to take me and go with me to the, to the uh, meeting the next morning for the exchange of, of the uh, material. Well, that evening, though, while at the Troyer residence, 
Earl Olson called and phoned to say that the first presidency was planning to give us the blessing document, no consideration at all. Well, I did a quick think and I said, no. We had offered the LDS church the very same thing that Hoffman required from us. No deal on the gift idea. And then I wondered, did I lose out altogether or what? <laughs> But Earl called me back about an hour later. He'd been in touch with the big boys, and he they acceded to my stipulation. So we met with Earl and his superior officer, whose name I don't recall. They had a brief press conference. We traded the material. They gave him the Book of Commandments, and he handed me the blessing document. And with a breathing, I was breathing a real sigh of relief. Uh, I hopped the flight home. Well. <laughs> Grant McMurray met my flight that evening, and we went directly to our offices where we carefully secured the document. And then we took it up to, this, to the meeting of the Standing High Council, which was in session, so that they, they wanted to see this blessing document. So we displayed it for them, and we allowed them to pass it around the, uh, the table so that each one could view it and read it personally. Well, you know, 60 days almost passed before our experts, forensic examiners of the U.S. Postal Service, had painstakingly assessed the two handwritings, Joseph Smith Jr. and his clerk, Thomas Bullock. Their independent conclusions from Ohio and Texas were these. We see no evidence of forgery. Now, the Macron labs in Chicago analyzed a tiny little plug from the lower left corner of the paper to report back that the paper in the document was, in fact, 19th century paper. Well, the, the, the 1980, well, oh, yeah, and then, then what I did was I, I wrote a letter in the Herald, uh, an article in the Herald, and I said, blessing document is authentic. Now, just think about that. All they said was, we see no evidence of forgery. They did not say that the document is authentic. That's what I said. <laughs> so it was a bit of a stretch, you know, <laughs> but uh, that, that subtly sort of escaped my attention in 1981. I was kind of glad to have the document, and we were glad that it was, uh, that it was not a forgery. At least we thought so at the time, based on their work. So, Next spring, the 1982 uh, conference of the RLDS Church, uh, the World Conference, uh, voted to include the blessing document in the historical appendix to the Doctrine and Covenants. And there it remained until 1988 when that conference ordered it withdrawn, because everybody knew by 1988 it was, it was a real forgery. The 1990 uh, World Conference removed the whole appendix altogether from the Doctrine and Covenants. So the blessing forgery remains in the Community of Christ archives. I think it's really cool to have an authentic forgery right in there in the archives. <laughs> <laughs> that is, Richard, that story is amazing. I, I love that, um, you know, you had a deal with Hoffman and he... <laughs> sold it to the LDS church, and then you yeah. had to change what you were doing. That is a crazy story. And the fact that we still have it with us, that's kind of cool yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I mean, really what it says to me is how incredibly, I mean, everyone knows this now by, by the docuseries, but how incredibly talented Mark Hoffman is at forgery. I mean, that all these <laughs> independent auditors said, yep, I mean, if I were in your shoes, I would have said it was authentic too. Like you don't know the difference between, you know, it's mm -hmm. not forged and authentic until you really know the difference. See that the, the key to trapping him was that the uh, the tech the technology uh, of paper and ink and um, analysis and all of this the technology literally exploded between nineteen uh, between nineteen eighty and nineteen eighty five. In 1985, that they began to discover 
that he was the originator of some seven, uh, 107 important church and national, I would say, USA, American uh, documents. And, uh, and they were so, the thing that made him so tantalizing was they were so believable that the Salamander letter of Martin Harris of, of, uh, of 1829, I think it was, that was one of his first big forgeries. And, um, and it, uh, it really had a lot of people uh, buzzing and sort of anxious and upset over uh, the implications of, um, uh, of the whole white salamander as a source of spiritual, uh, of a, sort of an occult kind of thing, you know. So anyway, but, but uh, he was a brilliant uh, forger, that's for sure. And in some uh, ways, it sounded like he was a bit of a brilliant psychiatrist or no, psychologist as well, because, you know, like he knew what people wanted and he didn't give people exactly what they wanted, but he gave us something really, really close. You know, it's like, oh, my gosh, yes, we'll take it. So it seems yeah. like he just knows he knew what to do. I, I'm just I'm yeah. intrigued, so intrigued by this whole story. Yeah, the, uh, he knew particularly well exactly what the RLDS people had been thirsting for for more than a hundred years. Yeah. And that was a specific written document from Joseph to Joseph with everything just spelled out, just like we'd been saying in our missionary literature all these years, but we only had tradition to go on. So, so he was a, he was a genius when it came to that, uh, you know, figuring out exactly what, um, what was needed to, to make a sale here or there, wherever he happened to go. Absolutely. Well, it turns out he went here and there. So. And everywhere. <laughs> and everywhere. So he wanted one of our Book of Commandments, and you said we had three of them. Like, what is would that be worth? Um, maybe even, I don't know if you want to answer what it was worth in 1984 or what it's worth now, but what, why did he want that so badly? <clears throat> well, I think he wanted it because he knew that it is, it is really one of the most valuable publications uh, um, in, in the Mormon background uh, on the market. Uh, and I think he knew that if, if he could sell it, if he could give us this forgery and get this, this book, he would probably make in 1981, somewhere between three and $5,000 uh, in 1981 dollars. Now, of course, <laughs> it's, we've had today, I think, well, uh, I've seen, uh, in some reports, I've seen that a, that a book of commandments in today's dollars would take would bring six figures. So the book has really quite quite a, a big value. Yeah, that that's a pretty serious inflation right there. My goodness. I mean, we are talking forty years ago, but still. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> so um, now, my my next question is. Now, after we found out it was a forgery, I'm assuming in 1985 when everyone figured it out, that's when we figured it out as well. Uh, what happened next? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, uh, Mark Hoffman uh, was, uh, was um, how do I say this? He wasn't convicted, but he was charged with uh, two murders. He uh, Hoffman knew that people were beginning to get suspicious because he was getting so many documents and selling them and, and, and this sort of thing. And they, of course, they're all forgeries. No, no, they're not all forgeries. He was actually a bona fide collector and he picked up some real documents and he sold them. And, you know, that helped his reputation somewhat. But he made some deals with uh, several people and, and he wasn't able to quite deliver on them uh, in a timely way. And they began to be uh, very uh, suspicious of his, um, of maybe of his credentials. I'm not sure just how far the suspicion went, but Hoffman, uh, I think, felt that they were um, a threat. And so that's why he did the murders, because he was uh, in the process of uh, dealing with some people that were really quite, um, uh, quite alarmed with, with his uh, performance. Uh, and the, Hoffman was afraid that he would be found out as the forger that he <laughs> really was. So anyway, he was charged and he pled guilty to the murders to avoid a trial and a certain death sentence, uh, which I suppose is a, what is it, a firing squad in Utah? Maybe they have lethal, I don't know what they have now. Back then, 
he didn't want to go to before a firing squad, so he got he pled guilty and began his service in the uh, in the um, Salt Lake City County Prison. I guess is guess where where the facility is. Um, so this raised the question then of um, well, what about the Book of Commandments? Now that the document is clearly a forgery and worthless, um, the Mormon Church president, I think uh, a member of the Twelve in the Council of Twelve of, of the Mormon Church, um, called the president of our church, uh, Wallace B. Smith, in 1987, and said, we really do want to return this Book of Commandments because you didn't you got the raw end of the deal. Now that was really kind of big in a way because the Mormon Church had already lost their shirt with uh, uh, buying the same document from Hoffman back in 1981. Anyway, <laughs> and so uh, so I I've got a lot of praise and a lot of good feeling about the Mormon officials wanting to be fair about this whole thing. I was asked in a Mormon History Association meeting before this happened, before this phone call to President Smith, um, I was asked, um, well, wouldn't you like to get your Book of Commandments back? And I said, well, no, a deal is a deal. <laughs> I guess I was pretty naive. I don't know. But um, so that's the way I left it. But they, they just kept. So so finally, Elder Dunn, I don't remember uh, Elder Dunn's first name. D-U-N-N -N was his last name. Uh, he called me after they, after our president talked with uh, with uh, the Mormon uh, authority, and uh, he said, "I'm I'm going to be passing through Kansas City. I'm on my way to Chicago. Uh, could I meet you in the Kansas City airport and bring you your doctor your book of commandments?" And uh, and I said, "Well, yeah, that'd be wonderful. Yeah." So I hopped in my car and I drove up to the airport and met him and had a nice conversation with him and. He had an associate with him. There were two of them, and I, I, I had a nice uh, visit there for a little while, and then uh, they went ahead and had to meet their connecting flight. So that that was that, and so I took the Book of Commandments and uh, uh, took it downtown and sold it for. Oh no, I I brought it back to the archives and safely put it away. <laughs> you are arch. too funny. <laughs> when you said sold it, I was like. <gasps> <laughs> that was exceptionally kind of the LDS church to call and yes, offer that back. Yeah. I was very pleased about that. I, I thought that they didn't really need to do that. I mean, a deal's a deal. <laughs> uh, but but st like that that makes me feel really really good towards them as well. So that that's a wonderful that's a wonderful part of the story and I'm really glad and and it is so important that you had such a good relationship with a lot of people yeah. there. That helped a lot. Yeah, that helped. And then I started that the year after I became a historian. I flew out to Utah and had a great a great conversation with Earl Olson back then, 14 years earlier. Oh, that's wonderful. And I know that Mark Shearer, who is uh, a past historian for the church, also had a good relationship with Utah. And I feel like that's what's really important is continuing that good relationship. So I'm just, I that warms my heart to hear that part of the story. The real champion of our of our. Uh, uh, Collegial relationships, however, between the, the historians and so on is Ron Romig. Ron Romig was for years the, the archivist for our church after Madeline Brunson retired. And, and Mark, uh, he, he just took our, our collegial level to a whole new, whole new uh, uh, plateau, you might say. And, and he, didn't, uh, he did quite a few document exchanges with the, with the LDS Mormon Church. Yeah. I'm so, a yeah. fan of Ron Romig. I, I really like that guy. He's a good guy. I am too. I am too. <laughs> well, Richard, gosh, what an amazing story. How cool to hear it from your own mouth. I just, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Was there something else you wanted to say that I didn't ask about? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think that pretty well covers what we talked about earlier. So. Oh, yeah. well, this has been so exciting for me to like, oh, now I feel yeah. like we've rounded out the story for me, at least. I don't know if it's true for everyone, but for me, we've rounded out the story. And I just think it's really cool that Community of Christ had a role to play in that in that part of the story. Yeah, me too. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this. I, I enjoyed uh, 
I enjoyed this very much. Oh, so great thank to see you. you. Okay. All right, Dick. Thanks so much. Alrighty. Bye now.